Hey, welcome back to the Group Project Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, this is episode number 99. We are one away from 100. And I've got none other than she's like the social media sensation here, Ray Hewart. Did I say that right? You did, yes. Okay, Ray Hewart is like the jack of all traits. And I know I've said that before in like 10 episodes about people, but Ray does everything. I mean, you got to check out the website. We'll get into it. But Ray, in your bio, the very first thing is you are the CXO for the Teach Better team. Yes, I am. So, it's so, one of my favorite jobs ever. So tell me, and we're going to get into it, obviously. Well, first of all, welcome. Thanks for coming today. You've had a busy day. Uh, there in Chicago land. Uh, it is one of the first days after New Year's. You had a wedding on New Year's Eve, as did I. Yes. Not I the same we one. The, I was going to say, I wish we were at the same wedding. We could have hung out in <laughs> real life and then done this podcast. And done it, yeah. <laughs> but anyways, hey, welcome to the show. And my gosh, look at your bio. And I'm just going to read a few things that you're doing. Executive Director of the Association of Illinois Middle Grade Schools. You're a TEDx speaker, educator, author of two books. So we're just going to dig into this. Um, you know, I mentioned to you before the show, usually on the show, we interview uh, principals, superintendents, kind of know like their daily practices, routines. Um, but I wanted to, to kick off 2022. I kind of want just somebody who's doing some really cool things that has some really cool experiences. Somebody that was, is in the Illinois State University Hall of Fame, uh, three or four years removed from being in college. I mean, you do so many cool things. So welcome to the show. Tell us anything you want to do about your, your profession, about what you're up to these days. and We'll go from there. Yeah, no, I love it. I'm honored to be here. And I know that you typically get like the all-star principals, the all-star superintendents. I get to be fortunate enough day to day that I get to work with some of those people. So I know this will be a great conversation, but yeah. Hi everyone. My name is Ray Hewart. Um, I love keeping busy. And to be honest, my goal over the last few years has to really grow a dynamic viewpoint of what education looks like. So I have been in the classroom for uh, the better part of a decade. I get to now work with principals and superintendents. I get to be a part of a nonprofit right now that's a state organization. And when you put it all together, it's been really fun to get some perspective on how education works and um, you know, working with college students. There's a whole list of things that have been really fun so far. So I definitely want to get into like what the Teach Better team does. But when I read your bio, something was just caught my attention was your experiences as a, as a student. I mean, you brought, you got, you went through some unique adversity. So maybe share, you know, what, what about your educational background maybe has inspired you to do the work that you're doing today? Yeah. Oh my gosh. You could spend the entire episode talking about this. Um, but yeah, so I was diagnosed SLD in second grade and reading, writing, and math. And that really has shaped a lot of my learning and not only as a person, but also then obviously my drive within education. Um, I am not still, I'm still not a reader. I consume most of my content, uh, about 80 to 90% of my content to learn via audio. So podcasts are a huge thing for me. And I think that that type of experience, along with so many other things I've been able to experience, really has given me a, a fun lens to look through. I was never supposed to be an educator. And so now being in this incredible field, it has allowed me to connect with students differently. It's allowed me to connect with other educators differently. And I, I really do see it as a blessing because like we hope for our students, I had every resource possible to be successful. And I am thankful that I had that because without the um, supports and opportunities I had growing up, and even now to this day, I don't really know what I would end up doing. So I'm very lucky. Where did you grow up at? I grew up in the Chicagoland area, northern suburb. So gosh, I, you know, I grew up with two incredible parents, extremely supportive family and friends, beautiful schools. Um, I was, I was a lucky one. And, and I joke all the time, you know, even through talking through learning struggles and everything else, I really did have what the supports we hope all of our students have, right? We hope every student doesn't have financial burden and has parents that are supportive of a dynamic learning opportunity, edu you know, education. So um, it was a great life. I can't complain. So grew up in the Northern suburbs for, um, you know, and I actually lived in Chicago. I lived in uh, Lincoln Park. Well, I mean, it was typical, like graduate from college. What are you going to do? Let's go live in Lincoln Park for a while. Yeah. But so you, after high school, then you went downstate to Illinois, to Illinois state, you're a Redbird for a few years, right? 
Yes, I was. So I was in high school, wasn't sure what I was going to do. And my reach school at the time was Illinois State University because they had a middle level program. I was dying yeah. to be a mean old math teacher. My mindset was if I was going to be lucky enough to get into college, why wouldn't I want to go teach the worst subject ever, which of course is math. So um, that was a really whole long story about how Illinois State ended up doing me the biggest favor ever by letting me in. I definitely didn't have the scores. Um, but when I waived my IEP supports, we just kind of made it all work. And I ended up at Illinois State for four years, graduating with an undergraduate degree. I later went back for my master's at the same university and went on faculty in 2019. So it's a great space. Wow. Wow. Okay. So, um, okay. So let's just jump to your teaching then. So you said that you have been teaching for, you know, kind of different in some different settings for the lot better part of a decade. What has your teaching career looked like? I have, I love teaching and now being able to teach teachers. I mean, even earlier today, I was telling you, I got to hang out in a, in a school, um, over in Peoria, Illinois, which is yeah. <laughs> a little far from me this morning. Um, but no, it was wonderful. I, um, was fortunate enough to be a middle school teacher my whole career. And, um, one of the big things I dabbled with as a classroom teacher is now what I get to do now specifically with teachers, which is, um, kind of two different elements of instructional design. One is mastery learning. So how can we bring mastery learning authentically into our classroom so that students can learn at the, their own pace, but also so, so teachers can manage it and truly understand the power of facilitating that type of progressive classroom. And the other is bringing in community support into our classrooms. I think Sometimes we find ourselves in silos in the school buildings that we work within. And the reality is that the community has a lot to teach us and our students have a lot to teach the community. So through those two kind of like layering process, I call yeah. it like the deli sandwich of education, right? You get the engagement, you get the community, you get the instructional framework. I love the work I do. So we de I want to come back to community support because you said about working in silos, like I'm thinking about our schools, no disrespect to anybody in our district, but I don't, I can't think of much community support that goes on in our classrooms. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Take yeah. us back to your first year of teaching. Okay. What was your biggest strength? And then what was maybe your biggest weakness? My goodness, my first year teaching, I attended a job fair my senior year, and there was a table open at the job fair. So of course you sit down and you practice, right? Even if you uh. don't know that you want to work there. And I sat down at a table for Galesburg, Illinois, which I had literally never heard of. Yes. And I, I truly, I interviewed for the job and I don't, I kind of embarrassed saying this, but I interviewed just to practice. I actually never yeah. intended to end up there. And they offered me a position and I absolutely was not turned down a teaching job at that time. So <laughs> um, I ended up moving to this little old town and I, I, I love Galesburg. It was wonderful. I think my biggest strength was um, I was working for a principal that literally wanted me to run the most ridiculous classroom on the planet. And so I think my, the biggest strength I had, I was given the opportunity to try anything like anything and resources at that time with who I was working for were seemingly endless. And so he really did light a fire um, within the passion I had and just let me kind of run and be ridiculous, which was wonderful. I learned a ton about what not to do and what to do. <laughs> uh -huh. um, my biggest weakness was probably, oh gosh, can I just go with work-life balance? Like I, I walked in that building when it was, when it was dark and I walked out when it was dark and I love that style, but that's not really sustainable, I guess, long-term. Yeah. Classic. You see that with so many, yeah. I mean, a large percentage of young teachers. I mean, a lot, large percentage of teachers in general, but I right. see that a lot like this this, uh, this feeling like you got to be perfect here. The first, and we know they're going to make mistakes. Uh, how did you overcome that work life? How long did it take for you to overcome that work life balance? Was it, I, you know, I can honestly say, I don't know that I ever, um, <laughs> have found the right balance. I think we kind of find different ways to find balance. I, I will tell you now, you know, obviously years later, I don't actually think I have a work life balance right now, but I do <laughs> know that every single thing on my calendar I enjoy. Sure. And so I think that's the biggest difference. It's not necessarily about finding the right 50, 50 balance between work and personal life. But when I look at my calendar today, I mean, geez, I got to get up early, grab a coffee and go hang out with middle school and elementary teachers all day. I think I got to drive back, um, spend an hour with my puppies 
and I get to a podcast interview with you. I'm hopping onto a mastermind for administrators after he, after this. And then I have girls night hanging out with friends. Like what's wrong with that calendar? It's the best calendar of the day. That's a really good count. We got to come back to the coffee idea. Let's not forget that either. Okay. Sounds good. We have a lot. <laughs> we have a whole list. We've got coffee. We've got community support and class. We got all kinds of stuff, but let's talk about the teach better team. I'm telling you guys, if you look at the website, and I don't know if, I mean, you gave me like a list of websites to check out. I checked out the, the main one, I think. There's so much on there. There's so much material, so much content. What can you tell us about the Teach Better team? Yeah, you know, the Teach Better team exists to support educators. And that includes anybody within the educational ecosystem. So if you go to Teach Better homepage, like teachbetter.com, you're going to see in like, my hope is that it's kind of like standing in a big room with a lot of doors open, right? One door is to go read a blog, right? We publish two or three blogs every single day. One door is to go walk into our podcast network. We have over 40 podcasts that publish episodes all the time. They can go explore content there. We have, you know, masterminds you can go explore. I, like the hope would be with all these doors open, you can kind of pick and choose what you want. And you know, we really believe in kind of these two pillars. One is obviously we we partner with school districts and provide professional development. That's what I got to do today. But this other element of my world of with Teach Better is that we get to foster a global community. You know, the mastermind that I'll pop into later today will have administrators from Sydney, Australia and Guatemala and, you know, Toronto and, um, you know, LA. And, and that's kind of the beauty of being a connected educator. So what you've talked about that, I, I know I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but yeah. this mastermind group, like you hear about this a lot in business. Like I'm a big reader. I know you mentioned you do a lot of your consumption, like with podcasts and visual. I read a lot. I read a lot in the business world about these mastermind groups. Maybe it, co- you know, there's a little bit of cost to be involved in some of those, but what is it? You know, a lot of us here in the Midwest, Midwest educational leaders, like we don't know, <laughs> we hear that and we're like, I don't know what that is. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. So tell us a little bit about your mastermind group. Yeah. So we have a few different masterminds. One is for, uh, first I want to preface, if you're going to be part of a mastermind group, you want to make sure it's really specific. Don't just walk into a mastermind that's too open-ended. Um, that's not worth your time. Anytime you're doing professional development or collaboration, you really want to have a focus. Um, one of our masterminds is for those educators, whoever they are, that are pursuing kind of a side hustle, right? These are the classroom teachers that are selling on teachers pay teachers. These are the administrators that want to get into public speaking. It's it, we call it edupreneur mastermind, right? How do you, Mm. what do you need to know? And what are the basics? Cause geez, none of us in education are taught these business tools on email lists and SEO and all that fun stuff. So Mm. that's kind of what we get into. Um, the mastermind I'm going to later today, we have a administrative mastermind that happens twice a week. And honestly, I just describe it as a boardroom where everybody comes together to talk shop and share ideas. So people ask questions and it's a very casual setting. Okay. Very cool. So if somebody wants to, if somebody's listening and they're like, I want that, I feel disconnected. I want to be with, I want to be in this boardroom, swap ideas. Like what's the next step for getting involved with that? So uh, you can just head to teachbear.com. Um, if you want to go specifically, you can go to teachbear.com slash mastermind and it's a free sign up. So I know sometimes, I know sometimes uh, there's a cost affiliated, but that one's free. Okay, cool. Well, I, I, if you can't hear in the background, we've got, is it Harvey or Alfred? Who's the one that's uh, acting up there? Both of them. So sorry. You know, they only wrestle together when I'm recording something. So this is just very timely. It, well, it just adds a little, it just adds an extra little spice to the show here. So you're good. Hey, I, you guys have a conference coming up in October, 2022. I mean, I know it's like, I say coming up, it's like nine months away, but. Oh, it's coming up. It's coming up. <laughs> so tell us about this conference and, and, you know, this shows, you know, mostly educational leaders, like why should an educational leader think about uh, attending the conference? No, I totally would encourage you to, but more importantly, I'd encourage you to submit a proposal. Proposals open for that conference March 1st, and they close, I think, at the end of April. So try and get it in before the end of March, just in case I'm wrong. Um, But geez, educational leaders should not only be attending to learn, but attending to share. Um, We really were never intended to facilitate a conference, but like I said, we do foster a really active educator community. Um, similar to the community that I'm sure many people listening are building on Twitter and Instagram. It's just another outlet to connect with like-minded 
educators that we say carry the teach better mindset, right? Better today, better tomorrow. And um, this conference was created because people kept saying like, oh, we got to get a time for everyone to get together. And with, yeah. you know, like our community is massive. So how do you get everybody together and how do you facilitate that it's a really intentional time? So we put on our first conference in 2019 and we always intended to do another after the success of the first and then COVID hit. So this will be our second conference. It will intentionally be very small. We loved the ability to be able to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with every single person there. We really believe in community and you can't facilitate a 2000 person conference if you believe in community. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, um, it's going to be just a wonderful time, October 14th and 15th. And I definitely encourage you all to come. The venue is gorgeous and we have a lot of surprises in store. So it should be great. <laughs> our keynotes and a, and a few of our speakers before all the proposals um, get released as well uh, should be coming soon. So it's going to be a great event. Cool. So where is it? Where, where is it at? It will be in Akron, Ohio this year. So it's actually at, um, I don't know if you're familiar, but Akron STEM is a middle school and it used to be the Museum of Innovation in the heart of Akron. And so we are stealing their building for the day or for the two day event. It's going to be great. So isn't that the home of LeBron James? Uh, it is. Yes. Are you a basketball he, fan? There you go. Are you holding out on us? Is he the keynote there? Or? Oh, I can't. I cannot release all of my special <laughs> surprises. You'll have to wait and see. Oh yeah. gosh. That's awesome. No, I, yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm looking at the website right now. Teachbetterconference.com is where I'm at. And uh, yeah, good prices there for the conference and the featured I, speakers. I will, are I will say, Jared, while it will be really fun for you just to attend, I want to give a shout out because I know that you specifically have an audience of principals and superintendents. It is free if you present. So I know that some conferences charge their speakers. I have no idea why that we do that because you can't have a conference without really, really good presenters. So if that encourages you, any, anybody listening, um, we do waive all registration and attendance costs. If you are presenting, even if you're only presenting a 20 minute session. So I said, I encourage you all to submit. I love what you're saying. Cause I have, I've just, again, no disrespect to the conferences I've been to. They've been great, great learning. I do feel like there, sometimes there's not that sense of energy when you go and it's a little, you've been doing the same thing for many, many, many years, the same setup. I do feel like there's a niche there for some innovative ways. And, and I, you, I see you nodding your head right there. I feel like what you're describing to me sounds like the new wave of, of conferences. Am I right? Uh, my hope is, I mean, our mindset is always that we want to put on an event that not only is featuring really progressive tangible suggestions. That's a big thing for us. We want you to actually be able to walk away with something, but we also, you know, again, we, nobody should be living on a silo. So focusing on community, focusing on getting people talking to each other, engaging with each other, getting sponsors to bring in wacky things to help us do that. These are all really fun things that we're excited to roll out at the conference. Cool. I, I mean, you're, I don't go to conferences very often because it's in our, you know, in our world, it's like so hard to give up a day, yeah. a, a day or two or three, especially you just feel so guilty. A, especially if it's a bored and boring and stuffy conference, you're like, oh my gosh, I really have so many things to do. And I'm here in a suit walking around. This is true. We, no, what is this, the attire there? What, tell me, what is the attire you think? I will tell you, I'm a little upset about this, but first off the attire for everybody attending, especially if you're presenting is come as you are, whatever that means for you. So Jared, I don't know if you're a, you know, like a really excited educator that wears really bold colors, but come as you are. I will say I am very classically always in kind of a black or white shirt. I wear neutrals and there's this thing going on with the team. I'm going to kill them. They're trying to get somebody to sponsor my outfit. And they're trying to specifically get someone to sponsor my outfit that will dress me in like bright, bold colors. So I don't know what I'm wearing yet, but I will tell you, I'm going to try really hard to wear black. <laughs> so if you go on Ray's page, I agree. And I, I, you know, and I was kind of recruiting her to come on the show. Uh, yeah, you're right. A lot of whites, a lot of black. So the, I think that's the price of my mission right there is to see if anybody does sponsor you for that, for that. Uh, I, uh, I'm a little nervous. It'll be October. So I'm like, what about fall colors guys? Like put yeah. me in a Brown or an yeah. orange. Yeah. They want like bright pink and yellow. I think I'd rather vomit. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. <laughs> Okay. So we're going to shift gears and get real serious for a second. Kind of, um, it's been a challenging year, a couple years for teachers. Right. Um, I mean, 
here in our every district, I feel like our district does a very good job of culture climate. We're we're um, we're staying above we're staying above water, but so many teachers out there are struggling. Uh, they're 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 burnout. I mean, we just returned from winter break, and I still feel like people are just trying to survive the year. What advice? Give us give us your sixty second advice for principals for school leaders. Like, what should we be doing? to help. And I, a lot of people haven't quite figured this out because teachers are still struggling. What should we be doing to help our staff out, our teachers out, get through this year? I don't think there is a one size fits all answer to this. Cause like you said, every single school, every single district and every single, single teacher needs something different right now. Um, I have two things. One is I, I truly believe that, that while you may not have the solution, somebody in, in this world will have the solution that's the right fit for you. So being choosing to be a connected educator, whether it's attending a mastermind, growing your PLN on Twitter or Instagram, um, choosing to take time in your schedule to network, however that looks for you in whatever space you're in is absolutely 1000% essential. Even just listening to this podcast right now, you're doing professional development, make sure you're connecting in some way with Jared, connecting in some way with the guests on the show, because there is something, the right fit for this one problem you have today, which by the way, will be different tomorrow, is possible. We just have to connect you with the right people. Um, with all that being said, I had shoulder surgery twice. And in the first time I had shoulder surgery, I was like very, very nervous. And I brought my mother with me because, you know, what, what good, you know, young female needs her mother when they go get surgery and I'm sitting ready for surgery. And this doctor walks in, I've never seen him before. And he has a needle bigger than the room we were in. I mean, this needle was so unbelievably large and he's explaining to me that he's going to stick it in my neck right before surgery to make sure that the medicine, you know, whatever. And I looked at him and I was like, I think I'm good. I'm going to put on my, my, my jeans. I'm going to go home. <laughs> I'm out. And, um, needless to say, you know, you get the, the welling up of the eyes and you're like, could you just knock me out first? And then literally, I don't care what, what you do. Um, the doctor looks at me and again, I have never met this man before this moment with this needle and he rolls his eyes and he goes, Ray, I've had people with worse injuries than you. And I've had people more nervous than you. Everyone turns out just fine. And then he said, move your head, turn this way, stuck the needle in all done. And then I went off to surgery. And I do have to tell you, while that probably wasn't an experience that I wish upon anybody else, that mindset is so appropriate for educators, especially leaders to carry right now. Your problems right now are a thousand percent real. They need to be solved and they're extremely important. But trust me, especially if you connect with my community, I can only imagine you as well, Jared, we've seen the most ridiculous problems exist. So whatever your problem is, we've seen it worse. Whatever your struggle is, we've seen it bad. So let's just work on getting a solution. So I think that that's just an important emphasis on making sure you're connected and really understanding that solutions do exist no matter how tough it seems. So the shoulder surgery, the same shoulder or same different? Shoulder. Yeah, I'm, I'm very lucky. My right shoulder loves me a lot. Wow. Okay. That is a, that's a good, I, I, I like that analogy though, for sure. Uh, hey, I was going to ask you about, okay. So, you, so we're going to uh, make believe here, obviously. You are in charge of a district. I don't care what size it is. And they're going to wipe the initiatives clean. You are starting from scratch. You are coming in and you, you know, think about the amount of PD that you have. It's not a ton, but you've got a whole, you know, you get to structure a whole year's worth. What would Ray Hewart recommend as what's your PD approach? Okay. And it, and if you need to ask me a little bit of context, I can give you a little bit more context, but I'm just curious because it feels, and here's, I usually try not to do too, too much speaking and all the asking questions, but I feel like school districts are all over the place with PD and they're doing all these different things and it's disconnected and it drives me nuts. So that's why I'm asking you, if you could come in uh, and, and, and it's a clean slate, what would you do? Okay, so we're gonna ignore the need for the first thing to do is get all of our leadership together and develop a three-year strategic plan. We're just gonna assume that that's that's it's already done. Already, already done. Already done. Um, I will say, you know, I mentioned I really do see education as, or especially our instruction in our classrooms, 
as like the perfect deli sandwich. We have to layer on all these things and they all serve different purposes. And then when you get that perfect sandwich, it tastes delici delicious, kids are supported, it's great. Um, with the chaos that educators are feeling, the lack of support, even as a leader, you know you're providing support, but the lack of support that's felt it, and, and the fact that teachers really do feel like this profession may not even be for them because of their stress level, I believe the only PD we can be doing right now is to go back to the fundamentals. We need to give our teachers the support and infrastructure that they need to be successful. The, the creativity is naturally within them, but when we're stressed and overwhelmed, we're not good at any of the good stuff. Mm -hmm. So my suggestion for professional development would always go back to mastery learning. We need to get our teachers understanding what their goals are, identifying those standards, identifying the targets from those standards, designing assessments, working their way backwards so that they know exactly where they're going using that backwards design, and then giving them the tools and resources in not a one, one size fits all, but give them the tools and resources so that we can say as a teacher, knowing you have these fundamentals and the strong base, how do you wanna overcome these other elements and really allowing them to have some choice and that experience is essential. Okay. So earlier you talked about instructional framework and I may have been like zo writing notes, zoning out a little bit, you know, what, just share more about this instructional framework. And I'm by no means a curriculum expert. So I might even be sounding dumb right now, no, um, you're good. but there's a lot of questions I've had of, do you have to have a pick an instructional frame? Do you have to have one for your staff or, you know, the, the, the opposite would be, you mentioned it, let's let them be creative. Let's, let's give them autonomy. Like why structure, you, you know, what uh, a system for having to teach and you're kind of nodding your head. So I'm going to let you take it from there. I hope that makes sense. Kind of give me your best, give me your best response there. Yeah, it does. You know, every district right now is focusing on different things. And the reality is that, is that when we have a strong base, focusing on different things becomes really easy because we're all working from the same space. Um, the mastery learning framework that, that we we actually were founded on the teach better team uh, was was working with is called the grid method. The grid method is a mastery framework that was designed in an eighth grade science classroom and now is implemented in schools K 12. And the beauty of this framework is it really requires the teacher to go through that backwards design of best, you know, data supported strategies to understand what type of journey they're taking their students on. Once that core fundamentals identified once those assessments are aligned to the standard then all the fun and how you get through that journey, how you get from point A to point B is the creativity of the teacher. And I really love being able to create a framework with teachers like I was even earlier today, where we do all start with this concrete base that we know works. And then every teacher gets to go on their own journey to explore and other topics will come up as needs that they need for future professional development, which is outstanding. That's exactly what should happen. But it's all from this core base, knowing that we are doing what we need to be doing for students to get them the support they need when they need it. So they've got a whole page here. I'm at their website of the grid yeah. method. Yeah, so, and you can learn a ton at teachbear.com slash the grid method. So what if, okay, I'm going to keep going down this rabbit hole for a second here. Um, what if somebody has been doing, and again, I'm going to sound stupid, but like a no, different good. instructional framework for a number of years. And it's just, yep. but you know, there's so, like, how, how do you, how do you change? How do you, um, and you're pointing at me. So maybe you got an idea there, but you know, yeah. that there's some people in that district that are like, we've been, do we got to keep doing it. We got to, it's like the sunk cost fallacy, right? Like we've been doing yeah. it for 10 years and, but it's not working. Like, how do you, uh, start that change or what would you recommend? So there's two approaches with that. Um, we really believe in our framework, but we also understand the core pillars of our framework. And if I can go to a teacher and they can model for me how they're achieving the same core pillars at the same level of success, well then hell, they don't need to use my framework. They got it all figured out. So this is not a come in change educators mentality. This is a come in, identify what a classroom fundamentally needs to look like and we have a resource that might help or a teacher might be able to show us that they're already meeting all of those expectations, which is exactly what we want. That is not a loss, that is a win. That is an outstanding educator there that needs different professional development because they already got the basics. On the flip side, what I do appreciate is that our framework is extremely flexible depending on the teacher's style and the subject level 
and the student population. So there might be a few frameworks that your teachers are using that, like I said, just like that deli sandwich, get layered on perfectly and they all can work together simultaneously, which is, you know, the hope for all professional development. Cool. So you visit a ton of buildings. It sounds like you were in Peoria today. And we always, I like for people to come away with two or three, you know, uh, you, we've given us a lot of ideas, but I'm curious, what are two or three innovative things, just like really cool things. It could be anything that you've seen in a building that you are like, Hey, if I was a principal and I started my own building, you've already started the PD. Now you're going to just implement a diff, another thing or two or three. What would those things be? Uh, okay. So today I had the coolest day today. So I was working with, um, one of the sessions I started was essentially a workshop in that community design that we, I mentioned earlier, where we're bringing our community in and then sending our students out into our community to foster that education. Uh, we call it the teach further model. And this mindset is that teachers design themed internships that are all sponsored by local or national businesses so that they bring the purpose of learning into the classroom first and then the instruction. Um, it's one of my passion projects. I love, I love this way of teaching and I, I love watching teachers create um, today, for example, as we were working through this, I was working with all exploratory teachers. I have no idea why that's what the popular, like it just kind of happened. So I was working with this reading teacher. Uh, I'm sorry, I was working with this um, music teacher, this PE teacher. I had two student teachers. I don't know what to do with them. And then I had this slew of just like creative educators that, you know, were in a bunch of different spaces. These were elementary, middle school and high school teachers. I also had the fax teacher. How cool is a fax teacher? And I loved watching them take this internship approach differently, depending on their grade level, their subject area, and their access to resources. Um, I was outside of Peoria, but I was actually working in a very, very small town outside of Peoria. And when you talk about community organizations, the first thing they think of is, oh, we only have a gas station in our community. And I look at them and I'm like, perfect. But that's the same response I give even when I'm working with the school in the inner city that has access to thousands of organizations within the block because we really can bring our community into our classroom through so many ways and Zoom has modeled that as well. So um, some of the coolest things I saw today were you know, music teachers that were looking up university audition applications so that they could teach their students how to apply for college if they wanna go into the arts. I was working with a PE teacher that was getting into a soccer unit that was looking at how to incorporate press conferences and eye contact and appropriate appropriate role model behavior to model that same practice. And uh, I don't know, it's just cool. So I think the creative element is huge once, like I said, you had those fundamentals. I don't think I answered your question though. Uh, it's okay. No, I think I, well, you've, I'm loving what you're saying. Cause when you, cause that first, when you said Peoria and at first I was like, oh yeah, of course a big city's got all these resources. But the fact that you're talking about a smaller town, I mean, we don't live I'm like in a pretty small area, you know, 10,000 population and um, yeah. not a ton of businesses. I'm always envious of the bigger cities that have those, but you're saying think outside the box. Like, don't think just it's got to be physically a, a business in town. It, it could be. Well, and, and there's two ways to go with that. One is we were talking about businesses in town and I had a teacher that was adamant. No, literally we only have a gas station. And I was like, okay, great. But what other businesses work in this community? You have snow plows. You have um, representatives in your community that, that represent this community in some sort of legislator. You have um, stay at home family members. You have like, there are community elements within the community that sometimes we don't see, but that support the community in a few different ways. Um, you have people that come and do um, landscape work in this community. Like all of those things exist. Outside of that, we also have massive organizations that can get involved in our communities. Some of my best sponsors was um, Walgreens and Buffalo Wild Wings and um, North Shore Hospital. Those are all extremely large organizations that weren't local businesses. You know, so all the all the ways that we look at sponsors is this discussion of how do you get an invested sponsor in your classroom. And my answer is, you get an invested sponsor just like you get an invested student and just like you get an invested parent. You don't get them, you make them. And so as you look at sponsors in your classroom, being able to build that with teachers, it's selling the same stuff that we've always been selling and it's that our work is powerful. Cool, cool. Hey, let's switch gears just a little bit here. You've actually written two books. I have. And as somebody who has just 
just published my first book last summer. Like, I want to thank you. I want to, I want to hear a little about your books and uh, yeah, just kind of uh, just share what you want about what it is it teachers deserve it and teach better. Yes. Two books. They were wonderful projects. I'm sure like you, they were projects that took quite some time. Um, and I, I have not read your book. I'm excited to, to learn more about your piece and, and dive into that as well. Um, teach better was published in 2019 with a few of my colleagues at the teach better team. And it's a really easy read, mostly for classroom teachers. Each chapter kind of focuses on a specific idea, how we can do it a little bit better. The main part of the book, to be honest, that I love the most is that it was written by four authors that got into education four different ways. And so there is a number of different perspectives that kind of go into how our classrooms are created, why we do the work that we do, which is kind of fun. Teachers Deserve It is actually kind of a sequel to a very, very popular um, book called Kids Deserve It. Kids Deserve It was written by Adam Welcome and Todd Nisloni, who are two incredible educators. Teachers Deserve It, I then wrote a few years later with Adam Welcome. And it was this concept that I hated when he originally pitched it to me because Kids Deserve It is a great book, but it's a motivational book about how we need to work hard because kids deserve the best. And I'm like, okay, how does that spin go with teachers? Like we're just going to bash on administrators and talk about how they don't support teachers, right? I mean, that's what you think of, right? Yeah. What, what do teachers deserve? Teachers deserve you know, the world. And I, I point blank told Adam, I'm like, that's not the story. You don't want me authoring that. That's, that's not something I would write. And he was like, well, I have the title, but but help me build the concept. And what we ended up doing was writing a book that was exceptionally empowering and talking about, yes, a list of all the things that teachers deserve. But then we talked about how teachers actually get to control and begin this narrative on getting what they deserve. Nothing is handed to you. And as a teacher, it's our responsibility to start the conversation. So every chapter is a big proclamation. You know, teachers deserve to wear jeans. Teachers deserve higher pay. Teachers, you know, all the things. To even teachers deserve, you know, leaders that support them in the work that they do. But what we did in the chapter is after we discussed why those, those things are quote unquote deserved, we talked about how teachers are at the core of ensuring that these things happen. You want to teach, you want a leader that supports you? Well, how are you going to your leader and communicating the work that you're most passionate about? How are you letting them in to see what your classroom looks like? And how are you understanding the leader's perspective before criticizing the leader for any concerns? So a lot of this book went into empowering teachers, which I loved. This is my favorite project I've ever worked on. I'm I'm uh, I'm at Amazon on the look inside feature. And it has a really fun flow. It's, you know, I'm Adam says, Ray says, and it's just a really fun. I mean, I'm just skimming it right now, but it's like a really uh, engaging uh, setup you've got there. I, I like it a lot. I appreciate it. Yeah, both Burks were with uh, Dave Burgess Consulting. You know, the Burgess crew's great over there. Yeah. So we really appreciate them letting us do that project. It was oh, definitely very fun. Cool. Very, very yeah. cool. Who did Back you publish with? Tell me about your book. I'm sure your listeners already know. <laughs> you know, here's the thing. And I, um, is that I met with a few different publishers and yeah. mine is like a total, like blog to book cool. disconnect. It, it, well, in my mind, cool. In my yeah. mind, like boom hit, you know, I just all kinds of ideas. The publishers I met with wanted it to be more of a coherent, um, like it all tied together, which I feel like it does, but they, I was like, no, I want to do it my own way. So I self-published. Good for you. Um, Jared, that's killer. Seriously. I did. It, yeah, I did it through uh, a company down in down in Arizona. They were, you know, you got to have the editor. I mean, I had a couple editors, but um, but yeah, it's it's been doing it's you know, I've had a fun ton of fun with it. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's always it's always really interesting to talk to different people who are doing kind of the same things. Just wanna I and I keep saying this, I sure I'm sure you feel the same way. Like I'm now removed from the classroom a little bit. Uh, in my role, but I, this gives me the outlet to be able to share ideas <laughs> and like still impact uh, educators in whatever setting they're in. So, um, well, and I can only imagine, I love that blog to book format. And so I, I think self-publishing is becoming, first of all, so popular and you are going to be such an asset to educators that are listening to your podcast thinking, well, I want to write a book, but I'm not sure I want to go through the rigmarole of going through a publisher. There are totally pros and cons, friends, to publishers. I just there want are. like that to be known. I, I work on a team. Um, the majority of my team has published books, and we've published with seven or eight different very popular publishers. 
pros and cons like crazy. So self-publishing is outstanding. I'm so excited yeah. for you. I can't wait to explore more. <laughs> we can do a whole separate like podcast on the pros and cons. I've had so many conversations with people yeah. about pros and cons and I've like steered them. I mean, if you've got a following built up, and you've got some marketing skills, you might not need a publisher. If you don't have much built up, you don't have an email list, you don't have the followers, like you probably need a publisher to help get the word out or else nobody's going to know about it. So, well, um, and, and, and yeah, and being able to collaborate with people that might be able to give you ideas on what you need to have built up versus what kind of comes with the process, I think is really good. So I hope people reach out to you to learn more about that. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is there any, before we go on to our quick hitters here, and get you out of here. Is there anything else you want to, uh, to share about your company, your professional background, uh, anything there? Goodness, I don't think so. We surely covered quite a lot. But of course, if anything comes up in the future, I encourage everybody who's listening to reach out anytime. Happy to, to share. I'm an open book. Okay, Ray, we're going to go into some quick hitters here. I don't know if you saw these ahead of time or not. I didn't, to be honest with you. So. Well, you're good at like winging it. You'll be good. Like you, this is your, like, you do this all the time. So in case you're joining us late episode number 99, the group project podcast, Ray Hewart. <laughs> I think I'm nailing that, right? You are, you are becoming my best friend. Trust me. <laughs> awesome. uh, she is the CXO. What does CXO stand for? Those of us not in the business world, help us out. No, I made it up and I love this. Can I tell you secretly? So, you know, I can't read. I, I really can't spell because of that deficit. Yeah. I'm just terrible. And I love, so the X stands for experience. It's really, really common right now, chief experience officer, but you can't be a CEO. That stands for something else. So it's a chief experience officer. I love that it's an X because I feel like it plays into the fact that yeah. like that's wrong, like that it's spelled wrong. I love it. CXO. So you got it. So Ray's doing some awesome stuff. Uh, I, and we're definitely, I, I want to ask you, you're doing so much stuff. And one of my questions is about productivity, because I feel like yeah. you have, you have uh, mastered the productivity and how to do all these different things. We'll get there in a second. Hey, the first question I always start with is if listeners visited your city, what's one restaurant they've got to check out? Oh, I just moved like two months ago. Okay. Um, definitely. I just moved to Naperville, Illinois, and I, uh, would encourage you all to go to the city and check out Piccolo Sogno. It's the best Italian restaurant in the entire planet. So where did you move from? I was living in central Illinois for the last 13 years. Okay. We're at in central Illinois. In Bloomington Normal, where Illinois state is. Yeah. Okay. So let's get a restaurant in Bloomington Normal then. Oh, see that too. Oh, there's so many. Okay. Um, Anju. It is a wonderful uh sushi and pizza place. So okay. good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We've got a lot of we've interviewed a lot of Illinois people. So um, so there's a good chance people are gonna be going through Bloomington there or up in the sh- who doesn't visit Chicago? I mean, I just met with a, my business manager earlier today who was in Chicago all uh holiday weekend. So yeah, definitely um, go check out those too. I'm telling you, those will be some of the best meals you've ever had. Next question is what is one like sneaky purchase that you've made that has made your life better? And whenever you talk to people, you're like, you got to buy this. It made my life so much better. Oh, do you mean like a work purchase or like something for, for like productivity? It could be anything. Okay. I was originally going to say my, the, my youngest, my puppy, um, was probably the best purchase I've made okay. recently, yeah. only because I walked into a shelter and picked him up. And there's a lot of laughs that come with that. Um, but I will say there is nothing like, can I nerd out for a second? There is nothing like having an iPhone and a Mac where you can copy and paste back and forth easily. I'm telling you, it saves my life with social media, like get, uh, get devices that are connected. I don't know how you do that or what people's preferences are, but that's the way to go. So give me like one more example, because I've got a Mac, I've got an iPhone, but like, talk to me about this copy and paste stuff. Okay. So if you have Apple products and I'm sure with other products, this is too, but I only have Mac experience. You can really sync these, these tools to essentially work together in tandem. And as many, many of you know, listening for social media, you can kind of only post on Instagram on your phone and but I might write my content on my computer. You can literally copy and paste on the computer and then paste it on the phone and it, it copies the text because they're synced. Yeah. I, yeah. I like that. Cause you're right. 
oh, I, you're right. We could geek out that for that for a while because yeah. I, I just try, love things that are easy. <laughs> yeah. And I, I like try not, I try not to spend, even though I do a ton of stuff on social media, I try not to spend much time on social media, if that makes sense. And Instagram is the one where I don't have it on my phone most of the week. But when I post there, when I'm doing more and more, I've got to download it because I can't. So I know exactly what you're saying. And especially like I used to type up content. I love to cite blogs. I used to type up content on my computer. I have to email it to myself to get it on my phone. That's a pain in the butt. Yeah. So. You've got to check out Ray's, uh, her stories, her stories, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. you're doing those. You're pretty good at those. Don't lie. I, don't, I appreciate don't lie. it. I, I do like sharing things on social. It's how, how I keep connected to my community. <laughs> okay. One book that has greatly influenced your life. The Go-Giver. It's a business book. Uh, if you're a superintendent and you haven't read it, it will change your life. If you're a principal, I hope it applies to you. I, I would encourage you to check that out. It's called The Go-Giver. It is the concept of carrying a service mentality, but with business. And I think that people don't talk about how superintendents are really just businessmen in education. So, so that's very true. Very Go-Giver true. will change your life. Go read it. Okay, give me one other book then, too. One more book. Oh, I don't know. Cause you know, I don't read. Oh, this one, this is my favorite book. Um, okay. The repair kit for grading. It's by Ken O'Connor. This is my favorite book to recommend to any educator that is in any way exploring adapting their grading practices. And here's why the book is split up by chapters by a bit by like a bold statement. It's called a fix. And what I encourage teachers to do is grab this book, um, go through jo only the chapter titles and label them green, red, and yellow, things that you already agree with, things that are, you might, you're kind of close to agreeing with it, and then red, not sure, you're not sure that that could ever be something you accept. Start with the green chapters first. You can skip around the whole book, slowly move to yellow, and then red. It's a really, really easy tool. Talk about grading. Yeah, good. All right, Ray, what is, um, whether it's Naperville or Bloomington, I guess I don't care, like what's the major gas station convenience store out in your neck of the woods? Oh, gas station is like BP. That's a big one out here. BP. Sure. Okay. So if Ray walks into BP and she's driving down to, to Peoria tomorrow again, okay. I mean, you, it, what are you grabbing? What are the, and you're starving and you're thirsty, you're starving, you're thirsty. You can get anything you want. Three yeah. items. What are you grabbing? Three. I'm grabbing Chex Mix for sure. The original, anything else is gross. And one of those overly priced Starbucks cold drinks the vanilla one. That's what I want. No, like the triple shot. <laughs> oh yeah. <absolutely. laughs> okay. That's two items. You get one other thing or you just, you just, you just maybe like a, like, like a Reese's that'd be good. The peanut butter cups. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, you can eat those at 8am who cares? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good combo. The checks mix and the, and the peanut butter cups. That's a great, great mix. I'm telling you, I live on check mix. I think it's kind of a food group. <laughs> Can you recall a job you applied for, but not, but did not get? Yeah, I applied to be a um, ELA teacher, my fifth year teaching at a middle school that was within my same district. Yes. And I, I didn't get it. I asked the principal why, because I wanted some feedback on, you know, what I could have done to improve. And, um, and they said that I had too much energy for the team that I was going to be working with, which was quite, quite an element of feedback. I, I, I appreciated the feedback. It was good. I don't regret not getting the job, but it's good feedback. So looking back on it, you just kind of mentioned it, like you're okay. Like you, you, it kind of worked out in the end. Is that what you're saying? I believe that not everything happens for a reason, but you can find meaning in everything. And for me, it wasn't the right time. It okay. really wasn't. Okay. Yeah. I ended up staying at where I was and actually doing, doing, you know, I was there a number, you know, like six more years. It was like, I, I learned a ton. So I was glad that I didn't move. I was very, very glad I didn't change. What is your best tip for being productive? Uh, I really believe in everything going on your calendar and blocking out time on your calendar rather than leaving it open. I have a Calendly link that you can like schedule time with me at any time that I give to people like candy. This ah. is great, by the way, if you're a principal or superintendent and you need an easy way to book time with people, Calendly is super easy. And um, that essentially means that Monday through Friday, essentially 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., anybody can schedule time with me. So I really do value filling my calendar, like I said, with things I love. And sometimes things I love is to make sure I can meet with people. And sometimes things I love is time away to have girls night. So 
Um, I think a calendar tool is the best way to make sure you have the most productive and effective day possible. So we were, I was going to come back to the coffee question. Uh, favorite place to get coffee? Right now it's Sparrow Coffee in Naperville, but I am a Starbucks girl. Starbucks. Okay. If you go to Starbucks, what are you getting? Is it winter or, or summer or where, where are we at? Um, winter. Okay. Winter. I'm getting a vanilla latte. What about Pete's coffee? Pete's coffee. I've been to one time. I, I need to go back. I wonder if they have a good vanilla latte. <laughs> Supposedly that's a thing in Chicago, right? That's the Chicago. There's, it was a couple of years ago. And, and you know what? Yeah, truly there's one down the street, but I cannot tell you, I think there's more coffee shops here than anything else. Like you could literally go coffee shop to coffee shop and spend all day doing that where I live. So <laughs> you drink caffeine all day. Uh, I am terrible. Yes, I do. I can drink a, a coffee at like nine o'clock at night and still go to bed by nine 30. Same here. Same yeah. here. <laughs> okay. One big goal you are currently working on. I did a Ted talk in 2020 and it was a massive m m thing for me. Um, that, which is a whole nother story. I don't know if we have time to get into, but, uh, it was wonderful. I learned a lot. Um, and I did not like my performance as much as I wanted to. And so a goal I have right now is to find a way to do another, put myself out there and do another. So we'll see. Cool. Cool. Okay. That's, that's it for my questions. Is there anything else you want to share before, uh, before we take off here? No, I'd encourage everybody to stay connected. I so appreciate you guys sticking through and enjoying the episode. I would yeah. love to hear what you think. And then we also hopefully hope that you don't see this as the one and only time we all get to learn from each other. So feel free to, you know, sh tell us that you're listening, um, whatever social media works best for you or email Jared or I, we'd love to hear what your thoughts were about this episode. And then hopefully we can yeah. get more conversation going between educators. So you're on, you're on all the socials, right? Instagram, I, Facebook, I am. It's Twitter. just my name. Yeah. So <laughs> at Ray Hewart, super easy. R-A-E-H-U-G-H-A-R-T. Awesome. I'm telling you guys, check out, check out the website. The, the conference sounds awesome. Check out the books and uh, yeah, reach out in terms of just some of the PD ideas. I, and, and they don't have to be, I mean, you guys are all over. It sounds like, right. Is well, that I was going to say our, our team is ever growing We've got about 26 team members right now. And they are all worth, uh, worth a follow. Like I, I cannot tell you, I work with the smartest people on the planet and while it would be so nice for you to connect with me, it's way more important you connect with the team. So cool. uh, definitely go check them out. Cause I, I mean, I learn every day from the people I work with. All right, Ray, where's girls night at tonight? Oh, you know what? We are fancy. We're actually meeting via Zoom because one of the people had a conflict. So I get to sit right here oh. for two hours. <laughs> awesome. Well, that'll be fun. That'll be a good time. So, hey, Ray, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it. Ton of energy. You got some cool ideas. Give her a follow. Check out those stories. Uh, she's got some good, just some fun stuff to watch and to see what she's up to. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Have a good night.